So good morning and uh, good afternoon, dear panelists, uh, dear all. Thank you all for being here today for this third session of uh, Rethinking Museums. So we know there's the power cut going on right now. So uh, thank you for, uh, for being able to connect. Um, we hope that it will, it will be reestablished soon. <laughs> uh, so this is a first of its kind series of uh, online discussions on uh, museum related topics. Today and until December 8, we will be exploring the shared experiences that tie French and Sri Lankan museums. This uh, third conversation will tackle museum inclusivity. So one of the answers that we often hear when discussing museums it is simply not for me. And uh, even based on recent numbers, we have seen that only around 40% of uh, French citizens have visited a museum at least once in the past year. And uh, we wanted a bit to, to question why is it so and what can museums do about it? And uh, how can museums become more attractive, especially towards marginalized communities? And what are the outreach policies that are at their disposal? So we'll be addressing this and uh, many other questions today. And uh, we're very happy to be counting among us four very distinguished guests to, uh, to address it. So Pape Ndiaye is a historian, professor at Sciences Po Paris, and is currently the director general of the Palais de la Porte Dorée. He has published numerous works on the history of Black Americans and Black populations in France. And his latest book is Black Americans from Slavery to Black Lives Matter. Dr. Vindia Boutpitia is an anthropologist and curator working at the intersection of conflict and visual culture. Her current research focuses on war, photography, civilian resistance in northern Sri Lanka, considers the local and the global aftermath of the civil conflict through the making and moving of images. Vindia is an associate lecturer in social anthropology at the University of St. Andrews and a member of Photodemos, the camera and the political imagination at UCL Anthropology. Dominique de Fonréau is a chief curator and director of mediation and cultural programs at the Musée du Louvre. She's a specialist in the 19th century art and museum history, and she has created numerous exhibitions in France and abroad and has published extensively. She teaches at Sciences Po to master students and is the scientific advisor to the School of Public Affairs. Her Yasami Mutulingam, known as Mutu, started his career as trade unionist in the 70s and after two decades he moved to the development field. While engaging as a trainer, he became a political columnist and a social researcher, publishing, among others, a book on the history of the Sri Lankan Dravidian movement. In 1991, he formed the Institute of Social Development to capacitate the tea plantation community to demand their legitimate rights and inclusion. In 97, he had initiated to create tea plantation worker museums and archives to expose the exclusion and highlight the grand narratives. The museum was open to, to the public in 2007, and uh, he's also an advisor and was an advisor to the Ministry of New Villagers and the State Infrastructure, as well as to the Tamil Progressive Alliance and International Federation of Worker Education. So we will start with the four presentations and then have about an hour for the questions and answers with the audience. So I invite you all to uh, write your questions in the chat box throughout the discussion, and they will be answered in the second part of this session. I also wanted to warn you that this discussion is being recorded and will be uploaded to our YouTube channel, especially for those that are unable to connect today. <laughs> so um, I leave the floor to our first presentation by uh, Pape Ndiaye. Thank you. Thank you, Aurelia. Thank you for your uh, invitation. It's a pleasure for me to uh, interact with uh, all of you. Uh, and uh, I do so as a historian, as a faculty, but also as uh, the uh, director of a museum, which uh, includes the Museum in the History of Immigration. So this uh, museum has uh, obviously uh, uh, a lot to do with uh, uh, issues of uh, inclusion. Uh, and this is really at the heart of what we are uh, thinking and, and, and doing these days. Uh, beyond the uh, museum and the history of immigration, the issue of uh, inclusion is not completely new. Of course, uh, there have been debates on that at least uh, since uh, the uh, 1980s uh, with uh, more and more people acknowledging that uh, museums are not or should not be ivory towers 
and that uh, they uh, need to attract more people, but also attract people who do not come on a regular basis, people who, for whom museums are far, um, as well as any um, other uh, central uh, cultural institutions. Uh, I'm thinking here of uh, opera houses, um, philharmonic orchestras, all these um, classic uh, institutional uh, cultural institutions have to face uh, similar issues regarding uh, the uh, sociology of their uh, public, uh, who comes, who does not come, and they are all engaged into reflections onto uh, the uh, outreach programs and the best way to connect to uh, their uh, public, including those who do not come. As I said, uh, this is obviously not uh, a purely uh, French matter. This, uh, these debates and uh, and uh, issues have been debated uh, throughout Europe. Uh, I was recently in in Germany, in the Netherlands. Uh, there are very uh, interesting debates uh, about all this. Uh, the same is true in uh, North America and uh, certainly also in in South Asia. Uh, an area I know less, but I'd, I'd be very uh, interested, of course, in um, listening to what uh, colleagues have to say about the uh, local situation, so to speak. So all this uh, is clearly uh, of uh, high interest, and I'm very happy to uh, debate about all these issues. To get back to uh, the uh, French uh, case, when dealing with uh, the issue of inclusion, we deal with a number of interrelated issues. The first I would uh, stress onto is that of the uh, employees and that of the uh, issue of diversity within uh, museum uh, ranks, within the staff of museum. And this is an issue uh, as uh, uh, most uh, curators, uh, I would say, uh, uh, come from uh, fairly uh, elitist uh, backgrounds. Uh, there are many reasons for that. Uh, and uh, the diversity uh, is not obvious at all when looking at the ranks of uh, curators. Um, a friend of mine from the United States was telling me last year was that each time he visits uh, a museum in France, he's uh, uh, or in Paris, I think he said, uh, he's struck by the fact that the basically the security and the janitors are non-white uh, people when the uh, higher ranks of the museum are white people. Uh, there is a kind of obvious uh, contrast here within the ranks of the museums. And when uh, discussing those issues, it's not just about social justice. It's not, it's not just a, a, a question of uh, morality. It is also a question of uh, sensibility, of, of cultural uh, sensibilities, of antennas in uh, more and more multicultural societies, such as European uh, societies. It is not always easy for museums to understand and to have uh, some finesse vis-a-vis -vis what French society is and the different communities, so to speak, or the different uh, components of French society. In order to understand that, one needs to have a more diverse uh, staff. This, of course, um, has all kind of uh, consequence regarding uh, the schools, regarding the, the training of curators, uh, which also uh, could be uh, debated in the French uh, case. Uh, the higher education system in France is fairly uh, elitist, as we know, there are very few elitist schools, which are, of course, of high quality, but their history, the way they recruit people, uh, can be uh, questioned and uh, debated. In any case, the issue of diversity is uh, a serious issue when dealing with uh, museums. It is also true in Germany, as I was told, uh, and in the Netherlands as well. That's a first uh, point. Uh, the second point I would um, address is that of uh, 
the exhibits, that of the uh, cultural offer uh, itself, uh, which uh, of course matters when uh, museums want and need to attract uh, more visitors and a more uh, diverse range of visitors. And uh, here I want to mention uh, a highly successful exhibit that opened in the spring of 2019 at the Musée d'Orsay. The title was Le Modèle Noir, the Black Model, uh, on um, the uh, French painting, uh, the representation of uh, Black persons, Black portraits from the late 18th century all the way to the 1930s. Uh, and this uh, exhibit, the first of its kind in, uh, in France, uh, following similar exhibits that opened in uh, North America or in the UK more recently. Uh, this uh, exhibit attracted uh, a large number of people, uh, over a half million visitors, which was way more than expected. But more interestingly, uh, many of these visitors were first timers people who didn't uh, come on a regular basis to, to say the least to the Musée d'Orsay. Uh, and uh, the, let's say, a, a kind of visual appreciation of the public suggests that many of those people were um, uh, people coming from uh, the suburbs, people who do not come to the uh, central institution. Uh, such as the Musée d'Orsay, uh, first, most often, as I said, first uh, uh, timers. So this was also something that uh, was of uh, high interest. The regular visitors, the usual suspects, if I may say, uh, did come, plus, of, as I said, new visitors that were attracted by this exhibit. So this exhibit spoke to those people. They uh, were especially interested in visiting this exhibit. So it uh, really is also about uh, the uh, exhibits themselves, what the way they are framed, uh, the possibility uh, for those exhibits uh, and the necessity, I would argue, to uh, include uh, non-whites, uh, to have uh, a more um, open understanding of uh, the uh, multiple processes uh, through which uh, Western art um, uh, grew um, in, uh, since uh, the uh, 17th uh, uh, century. That includes, of course, the issue of uh, colonization uh, to which uh, Western art uh, has been very much connected or was very much uh, connected for centuries. All those issues uh, can be uh, discussed, can be uh, presented in museums. And obviously, this is of uh, high interest to uh, many people, including, as I said, people who do not come to museums uh, for um, many reasons, and not, and not only uh, reasons that would be uh, based on uh, the, the fees and, and, and the prices as uh, these museums can, are not always uh, expensive. Sometimes they are, uh, they are free uh, every uh, Sunday, the first Sunday of every month. And, uh, and, and more largely, uh, uh, cultural issues are not fully connected to uh, the, the price, the, the financial issues, even if this can be also taken into account. So uh, the staff, as I said, the uh, content, the exhibits uh, themselves, uh, all this uh, can engage museums into uh, a deep reflection on their connection to the public and to a wide uh, public, uh, as, I, as I said. Another issue could be that of um, the location, the geography, uh, museums, uh, the most central institutional museums are uh, uh, located in uh, the most uh, central areas of uh, large cities such as Paris. So there are also issues related to 
uh, the possibility for these museums to open antennas uh, out of uh, these uh, uh, center areas. Uh, I'm thinking here of the Louvre Lens, the uh, uh, antenna, so to speak. It's more than an antenna. It's a real museum that opened in Northern France um, a few years ago. Um, I haven't read recently about Le Louvre Lens, about the audience and the success of this, uh, of this museum. This is something we might get back to uh, later. Uh, but uh, the idea to deconcentrate and to um, go and, and, and reach people rather than just wait for the visitors is uh, worth uh, uh, taking into account. Last uh, but not least, I want to um, stress uh, the fact uh, that um, visitors need also to be uh, welcomed and um, um, in, in, in a way that make them uh, comfortable. Museums are places with um, rules of conduct, uh, so to speak. People do not have to speak too loud. They have to behave uh, in uh, many ways. Uh, and I've uh, read about a number of incidents related to um, young people, uh, people, for example, uh, groups of uh, students, uh, kids who uh, do not behave uh, properly. So. There are tensions sometimes. So it's also about uh, the proper way to welcome people and to make people feel uh, comfortable in those institutions, including people who do not master the, the codes uh, of behavior uh, related to uh, the uh, museums. It's about that. It's about also the uh, uh, inclusion of uh, children I'm struck by the fact that, uh, of course, children are visitors like any other uh, people uh, and museums uh, do not always have the, besides a few things for the kids, uh, a few pencils, uh, a few papers, but museums do not always have the, the equipment uh, that is needed for children, rooms uh, where they can, uh, uh, express their uh, artistic sense, um, uh, specially trained uh, uh, guides, all kind of uh, things that uh, help attract uh, children and make them uh, comfortable in, uh, in, uh, in museums. All this uh, needs to be uh, refined, needs to be um, reflected upon uh, so as to make museums uh, definitely uh, open to make them uh, comfortable, to make them places where people can feel uh, at home, uh, so, so to speak. How do we make museums places where people feel at home, where they can experience new things, of course, when they can interact with new cultures, uh, but how do we make them uh, places where they can, in the case of the history, in the Museum and the History of Immigration, where uh, visitors can feel and can reconnect their own family history to uh, the uh, classic French uh, master narrative so that uh, in history, so that they feel that their family history is part of uh, French history. Uh, so this is what we are thinking about. And uh, preparing uh, for the opening of the uh, permanent exhibit on, of the Museum in the History of Immigration. So all this uh, is, is, is discussed and, and, and I'm very happy that museums uh, have been engaged for some time into uh, these uh, reflections. Uh, and I must say that uh, the uh, Black Lives Matter movement uh, last year or year and a half ago also uh, encouraged uh, those institutions to deal with uh, issues and to put those issues uh, at the forefront of their uh, strategies uh, for the years to come. Thank you very Thank you. much. <laughs>
Thank you, Babendiai, for this uh, presentation. Uh, we'll go directly to, to Vindia Bukutia's uh, presentation. I'll leave the floor to you. Um, thank you, Pat, for that wonderful presentation and Aurelia for extending this invitation to think together about building inclusive museums. And it's such an honor to be in such illustrious and accomplished company. So thank you. Um, I'm here in my capacity as a curator of the Museum of Religious Freedom in Sri Lanka, which is a pioneering virtual project that is aimed at expanding public conversations around the freedom of religion and belief, um, especially in the wake of many decades of atrocity, which took place during the civil war years, uh, as well as the innumerable tensions and episodes of violence that continue to impact the island's ethno-religious minorities. Um, this in turn today gravely affects the necessity and possibility for solidarity and recovery, especially in the face of failures of governance, legislative and accountability mechanisms. Um, before I speak on some of the curatorial and research oriented choices we made in relation to the design and development of the museum, so to touch on the inclusion stuff, um, allow me also to offer uh, some context in acknowledging the extraordinary enthusiasm, commitment, and labor of the core team at Minor Matters, including Yamini Yavindra and Mike Gabriel, Shalomi Daniel, and Akshana Palihavaduna, among others. I'm conveying their words initially to tell you a little bit more about how this idea for a virtual museum um, was practically transformed into a collaborative, creative, experimental intervention um, built on extensive archival and ethnographic research as well as involvements from some of the communities whose histories and experiences have been shaped by some of what is charted in the museum. In 2018, Minor Matters was launched as a national campaign to promote the freedom of religion or belief, it was launched as a response to the anti-Muslim riots, which took place in 2018, bearing in mind also the youth as perpetrators of violence during this particular incident. In 2019, um, the proposed project to build a virtual museum was the recipient of an Intercultural Innovation Award by the United Nations Alliance of Civilizations as well as the BMW Group from among 1,200 applicants in 128 countries. So the idea for the museum was conceived out of the intention to create greater awareness, responsiveness and respect for freedom of religion and belief, particularly among young people. Um, a big part of this has also been the investment made in the pedagogical aspects of the museum, because it's not one necessarily centered around a collection of material objects as we're, you know, typically associate museums with, um, and was firstly based on undertaking a very comprehensive process of primary and secondary research to define the parameters of what the museum could contain and narrate, um, which was led by our resident historian and lead researcher Shamara Wettemuni, whose own research on early 20th century Salon was foundational to some of what we try to grapple with in the museum. So this work was began as sort of being centered around 72 historical and contemporary events, which were identified as pivotal to issues of freedom of religion and belief in Sri Lanka beginning in 1815 with the signing of the Candian Convention, which was really the moment of Sri Lanka state formation, as it were. Um, the Museum of Religion's Freedom is mapped onto a chronology which reflects ultimately on the entanglements of state citizenship um, and religion through the period of British colonization and onwards. Um, when Ceylon's nation stateness was consolidated and thinking through how its religious character was historically and politically constituted, as well as the colonial and post-colonial national and importantly transnational formation of the island's ethno-religious identities. And this is a big part of what we grapple with in terms of our historical material to really encourage people to question identity formation and the kind of uh, interweaving of colonialism with this process. It is at this point that I inherited this body of research and given this immense opportunity to transform a series of ideas, conversations, chronologies, archival documents into a virtual museum space, which we're greatly looking forward to sharing with you. The museum website is now live and in advance of the official launch, we invite you to browse through some of what we brought together and what will be developed and expanded further um, as we learn and improve. Um, Personally, I came into this as a sort of visual political anthropologist whose relationship to museums, the ethnographic, has had been defined and vexed by my disciplinary training, but also anthropology's troubled relationship to the past and presence of museums. In 
the many months spent on realizing this museum project as conceptual exercise as much as practical necessity, we were endlessly confronted with what sometimes felt like insurmountable archival visual material silences and absences. In other words, what would we put in the museum when our tangible histories in its multiple forms and formulations didn't quite belong to us? How might we build a community around this quite bold proposition against the grain of our political realities and experiences? And ultimately, how do you take a museum to people, um, which is where the inclusion element comes in? Where both the archive and the museum, as we generally understand it, are colonial inventions in the space of Sri Lanka. These were also rapidly co-opted and wielded by a majoritarian post-colonial state that manufactures additional silences, absences, and forgetting to sustain other kinds of hegemonies through selective or willfully inadequate practices of record keeping, scarcity of resources and skills for documentation and preservation, challenges to access, as well as a long history of displacement and extraction that defines the colonial instituted museum space. This was further troubled uh, by our collective pledge to address the effects of Sri Lanka's civil war on issues of religious uh, freedom uh, in a sort of upfront way in the space of the museum. And this is also something that remains mired in the discordant sort of narratives of war alongside continuing demands and grievances around justice and accountability, which are, which, which are unresolved. So in other words, how do you build a museum of multiply displaced and fragmented histories? How do you reconcile unresolved or contending narratives? How do you critically reimagine the space of the museum, which is so laden with the weight of inequality so as to not suspend, petrify, or make stagnant the socially and the politically urgent, um, especially as we remain confronted by these questions in an environment of ongoing conflicts and tension. So this is where the virtualness of the museum and the possibilities afforded by the te technology um, available to us helped remedy some of the more epistemic and conceptual dilemmas and to focus wholly on prioritizing our communities and what we imagine the communities of the museum would look like. I must draw attention to the improvisation and creativity that went into sourcing materials to be included in the museum, which for which we're grateful um, to our group of community and expert contributors, researchers, artists, and our fantastic art director, Tilini Pereira, and developer, Shana Vijaysinghe, for helping us also wield the imaginative capacities of the virtual and center learning aimed at a younger demographic through, well, first and foremost, portability, the fact that the museum is on your screen, active, ele active exploration, as through um, elements of gamification. The museum is also paired with the Minor Matters e-learning platform and is designed to facilitate learning and literacy, uh, building on freedom of religion or belief as a part of an ongoing program to engage with youth journalists, civil society actors, and faith leaders, among others, to advance um, reconciliation, counter-religious um, extremism, and promote coexistence. So the Museum of Religious Freedom in Sri Lanka is centered first and foremost on our communities, and their diverse, vibrant, and sometimes difficult relationships. This effort was motivated by a pledge to address um, complex past and presence, but to think through how it might become an active and inclusive site of participatory community learning geared towards encouraging critical reflection on our shared histories, landscapes, topographies, and the formation of identities. So where possible, we also engaged with communities affected by some of the tensions and violences that we delve into and incorporated their knowledge, their testimony and recollections, as well as their own practices of archiving and remembering um, in audiovisual form to foster healing through memorialization, which is a big sort of politically contentious issue in Sri Lanka. We have commissioned artists to respond to the themes of the museum and create new virtual installations on the overarching questions of religious syncretism and tension. It is also importantly a wholly trilingual endeavor in English, Sinhala, and Tamil to ensure that language does not limit access to history or learning. And we have an exciting forthcoming program for offline components to complement and bridge the virtual, which will kick off early next year as we expand the museum community. We've also tried to use archival materials uh, that we did have access to as critically and subversively as possible to challenge some of the more normalized perceptions and practices around museums. Ultimately, what we anticipate is that this virtual space will afford us an opportunity to build on and sustain um, 
what might not be possible otherwise and to experiment, innovate and circumvent some of the challenges that we might face um, when confronted with the limits of the physical and the material. And we hope that it marks a small but important contribution to diversifying some of the historical and contemporary narratives and importantly representations um, and also extending and enhancing access of this sort of elusive material to build solidarities and that the museum space can be hopefully where some of that begins um, and sort of encourage um, collective thinking uh, around some of unresolved, some unresolved presence and past and um, hopefully begin a set of conversations uh, to do better for and right by going forward. So on that note, I'm going to conclude, but I'm happy to take any questions that you might have. Thank you very much, India, for a very insightful presentation. Uh, we'll go straight to the third presentation by Dominique de Fonrio. And, and don't hesitate in the meantime for the audience to ask questions if you have on the presentations already. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Aurelia, and thank you very much to Pap and to uh, Vindia for this very uh, fruitful and inspiring uh, presentation. Um, I want, of course, what uh, Pap just uh, said is very important. We, we, we are faced with a, a new society, and this new society um, obliged us to imagine new stories to, to visitors. We, uh, the wonderful things with, with the museums and especially in France and Great Britain, is the fact that they have been created for everybody. And the, this capacity of being universal should be seen as a threat because this universalism has been often said as being uh, a kind of colonial, colonialist universalism. But this universalism is also uh, a kind of a goal of speaking to everybody and that everybody um, will feel to be welcome within the museum. It's very important. It's particularly an issue for the Louvre because the Louvre is a, a quite ancient museum. It's a very large museum. It's a wonderful museum in terms of collections, but it's also a museum that can be seen as a place not for everybody, not a welcoming place for anybody. And it's very important to have that in mind. That's the reason why uh, we have been into um, different experiments in the past few years, and we are, of course, into new uh, today, uh, in two directions. How people feel welcome within the Louvre, and then when I say within the Louvre, is both the Louvre uh, inside and also the Louvre outside, because today, uh, all the issues regarding, for instance, uh, website, uh, virtuality, um, any uh, virtual exhibitions and so on are very important. So the Louvre is not only the Louvre within the Louvre, within the walls of the Louvre, but the Louvre outside. And it's very important to have both. And so that people feel welcome. And also to go into new stories to be told within the Louvre. Uh, to, give some, uh, to give some examples of, of these two things, to welcome is an issue, of course, of languages. Uh, to uh, French, English, uh, uh, German, uh, Spanish, Chinese, Japanese languages as such. That's the reason why we're developing new uh, translations into many languages of different tools. But also, it's also an issue of the way you are speaking to, to people. How am I welcome uh, if I'm coming uh, from... Um, you know, uh, uh, places where I've not been educated to museum. And it's very important to have both. So it's a question of language, but also the questions of stories you're, you're, you're telling. And the, um, the, the other issues in terms of interpretation, of course, and to give an, uh, an example, um, uh, it's not possible anymore not to tell people uh, where, for instance, uh, the, uh, the, the materials uh, from where the, the, the works of art have been made uh, came from. Speaking about gold, came speaking about ivory, uh, sp uh, sp speaking about mahogany, for instance, it's very important to say so. So it's a new ways of looking uh, at works of art. The, the very, uh, I think, um, something I'm very, uh, I'm convinced more than, you know, more today than ever, is the fact that works of art 
uh, because of their uh, nature of masterworks uh, are the wonderful ways of telling very different stories. They can, not only they can resist to the different stories, they won't lose anything because of the different series, but more, stories, but more than that, they are open new words in a way, because uh, they are um, the, the, among the best achievements of uh, human mind. And it's something that of course is common and could be shared by anybody. So it's very important, uh, very important uh, to, for us to have that in mind and to think of uh, telling new stories from our collections today. Um, I have a, a small presentation with uh, only some images. It's uh, our only images, but uh, to present you very briefly some experience, experiments we, we did in the past, so we have done in the past few years and for building and inclusive museums. But the first one, and very <clears throat> briefly, is what we, we did in 2019 between the, before this awful situation, but I won't, we won't talk about uh, sanitary conditions of today. I hope we will get rid of that. The first one was uh, what we call La Nocturne du Samedi, and it was organized one Saturday night per, uh, per, um, per month and open, thank you, Aurelia, to, 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 to go within the PowerPoint, and one, um, one Saturday per month, the first one, and it was um, it was open uh, especially to young uh, people. Uh, when I mean young people, I mean uh, uh, young grown-ups and also families. And uh, one Saturday per month, we have been organizing. The museum was free; the entrance was free for anybody, and uh, all the museums was open. And in a, in, a, in a part of the museums, you organize uh, some uh, kind of uh, festival with different artists. I mean, with actors, musicians, dancers, and uh, the visitors were able not only to, to watch uh, the performances of the different artists, but they were also, uh, it was the possibility for them to be actors of their visit. And it has been a wonderful success. I have a few images, if you can go through, please. Uh, Aurelia, that's what uh, I was saying, the roof for all, you, me, uh, they, us, it's very important. So different things, uh, puzzles, for instance, uh, la, uh, puzzles uh, right here, the, the other images, uh, um, dark within the galleries and to, uh, to make the, the visitors able to, uh, in fact, lighting up the, 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 the sculptures themselves and to find them. And I have another slide on the nocturne with actors uh, within uh, within the, the galleries, and uh, it was a tremendous success. And I hope that uh, the sanitary conditions will uh, allow us to come back uh, to this experiment. Um, very few figures about that. Uh, we um, we welcome uh, the people who, who came to these nocturnes. Uh, the, the age was below uh, 35, and uh, uh, which is wonderful because usually. <laughs> The age of our, the average age of uh, of our visitors of between fifty five and sixty, so not exactly the same age. And more than that, most of the people who came came from from Paris suburbs, and uh, and it was very and it was very often their first time in the museum or their first time in the museums as grown ups, uh, uh, and uh, it's very interesting to to say so. So I think that um, if you're doing something different if you are telling people please come and if you are in fact considering them not only as visitors but also as actors i think it's very important that, that you know acting people then they, they feel uh, welcome within the museum the other experiment we, we have is a coming experiment because it's a studio it's a new place that should open uh, should have opened in september and will open in december i, I hope for the for the Christmas vacation. And uh, it's a new place within the Louvre. Uh, please, there's a slide, Aurelia, thank you so much. Uh, it's a new space within the Louvre, which, um, which will aim to, uh, in fact, uh, give new keys, to, new keys to the museums. And it will be a, a place to rest, to read, to write, to learn, to watch, to listen, to, to draw, to, uh, to smile, to laugh, to be yourself to be maybe the most important part of yourself to meet other people. It's very important. It's a very new space. It's a place where you have, we, we will have two uh, locations. One with a, what we call 
the forum, uh, a place where anybody will be welcome, and uh, other places with workshops for people. I have several images if you want to pass through uh, to show you what it will be. Uh, and uh, we have a pre-opening, and that's the reason why we have these images. So it will be for families, but not only for families, it will be for, for any individual visitors coming to the Louvre. And uh, it will be also uh, a place for cultural programmations, because one thing is very important uh, when I'm speaking to um, <clears throat> imagine new stories on the museum is the fact that certainly uh, artists are wonderful interpreters of the museum of today. So going through and giving uh, the place to artists to give, in fact, new interpretations is also very something very important. And when I say artists, it's of course uh, uh, painters, but it could be also uh, uh, it could be also uh, musicians, and it could be uh, from museums, classic musicians, but also uh, rappers or you know break dance. Or I mean, it's very important to have so. And when when we did so uh, during the nocturne, to have different kind of uh, of um, uh, of people coming and different kind of artistic creation organized within uh, within the museum. Uh, different other things, and it's something we are into, and it's maybe one of the very slight good things of the COVID, if I may say so. I know, I'm not that sure that that's too many good things about the COVID, but one is the fact that we have been forced to organize uh, the museum outside and to organize the virtual museums because, of course, the museum was the Louvre was closed, well, like any museum. So we have been obliged to organize organize new thing and something very interesting that we have a, we have now a new website and more than that we are the, we have the possibility of organizing live sessions of things uh, going uh, in fact taking um, taking place within the Louvre and also being broadcasted to uh, our YouTube channel or our, our website and that's something very important that's the reason why uh, we have been for instance uh, music. Uh, but so, but also theater uh, and also, uh, for instance, films for the young people, different things. And now we are also designing uh, new uh, programs. And for instance, uh, two podcasts uh, we uh, we uh, we did last year. One on the Les Enquêtes du Louvre is a kind of a thriller on the Louvre, on the on the on the works of art, and it's very interesting because we are. <clears throat> linking people, of course, historian of art, but also people uh, from other field, uh, artists, but also, um, uh, for instance, for the, 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 the work of art right there, which is about the tree tree in the 17th century. Uh, we have also been dealing with people used to go to casino, uh, a professional player. So, you know, are opening to uh, other people and also with uh, France Inter, which is a national radio in, in France, uh, what we call Les Odyssey, especially for kids and families with a, both tremendous success. And the, the small images you have uh, on the, on the just before, uh, just before the slide before Aurelia, the, the, the small images you have now, uh, right after, the one after, yeah, the, the images with Egyptian uh, drawings you have uh, in, the, in the upper right is something I'm very, very pleased to tell. Uh, uh, next year, we will uh, co-produce co -produce, uh, a cartoon with a very famous cartoonist, a French cartoonist, uh, Michel Oslo. Uh, and uh, we, are, we, we did wonderful cartoons and very successful cartoons, especially in Swiss Africa. And it will be, as, as far as I know, the first time that the fine arts museums will co-produce a cartoon. And it will be broadcasting uh, in... Um, at the end of, uh, of the year 2022 and presented uh, within the Louvre um, uh, with an, ex an exhibition, within an exhibition dedicated to uh, Pharaon of Sudan, the African Pharaon, uh, who uh, were the masters of Egypt and of the overall Egypt from the, from, uh, from the what, what was called Nubia at that time up to, uh, to the Mediterranean Sea. And uh, what Pap just said before is very important in terms of the exhibition. It's all as uh, it has been done in, in Orsay with the Model Noir, or as I did some years ago at the Musée de la Croix when I welcomed um, the Fondation Turam and to open also 
uh, new ways and new ways of looking at collection is very important that we will have new subjects of exhibitions is very important for that, but also that with exhibitions we're organizing to open up, up to the society of today and to open to contemporary issues. And for instance, um, for the, the, the exhibition on, um, on the Black Pharaon next year, on the, on the, which will take place in the Louvre in the spring, uh, we will open up, uh, up to today thanks to the cartoon of Michel Oslo and also thanks to programs speaking of the issues of Africa today. So it's, a, it's a, for us, I think, very interesting. And then just to the end, um, uh, we are into uh, virtuality and it's the last, uh, the last slide. And uh, we produced two years ago, uh, virtual reality on, uh, on Mona Lisa and which, um, which, uh, was, uh, which took place within the loop, but which was also afterwards uh, broadcasted uh, on our website and on our uh, YouTube channel. And we are designing, and it's um, below, uh, for the first time, along with um, uh, La Réunion des Musées Nationaux, which is a, a French organization, the first uh, um, numeric and virtual exhibitions on Mona Lisa as well which will be uh, presented first in Marseille. And the choice of Marseille is very important for us as well to open it to new people. And afterwards we'll be able, of course, the, the, the exhibition will be able to, to travel and will be presented in, a, in different cities and different countries, of course. And uh, the fact certainly that uh, speaking of the Louvre today is not only to speak to of the Louvre within the walls and within the collections, but also open it to the world and certainly it's both the new missions for the Louvre, of course, because the society we're living in is new, but also it's uh, certainly an old story as well, because the Louvre in uh, 1793 was created to be able to talk to anybody, to welcome anybody. And I think that uh, uh, opening up the Louvre is also to be true to, the, to its core mission and to its core duties. So um, I, something I must say that I'm quite proud of being involved in, uh, in such a venture. Thank you so much, of course. Thank you very much, uh, Dominique de Fourio. It was a very, very interesting. Uh, we'll go straight to the last presentation with uh, Perry Asami Mutwing now. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, sorry. Thank you very much for this opportunity. I think uh, I listened to the, all the presenters uh, and they have gave uh, a good uh, input for this uh, discussion. I think uh, if you take this, uh, my role as an activist, just uh, I initiated a museum for the community in 1997 and it was open for the public in 2007. You know, uh, although I'm not uh, coming from the museology or academic uh, background, as an activist, I realize the exclusion of one community who is brought by the British as indentured labor during the colonial period. So when I started uh, working as a trade union, as well as the uh, in a, working as a journalist and a writer, then uh, I identify the need of uh, a museum to educate the, the community as well as the, the other communities about the contribution made by the particular community and how it was uh, totally exploited by the ex colonialist as well as the, the post colonial period by the current uh, uh, regimes. So that's how I initiated to, to start the museum. So this museum uh, initiated in 1997 by collecting the artifacts and oral histories and also uh, their folklore and uh, 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 their written histories. And um, so why I collected that? Because if you look at the museum can teach or the future generation. The museum can promote 
a new thinking or new perspective for the new world because history shows if not history is not uh, <clears throat> understood or history was not uh, well articulated then it is difficult to build a new history or a new uh, structure so that's why with that intention i initiated this museum in 1997 but when we initiated this uh, museum in 1997 at that time uh, because uh, most of the people in sri lanka they are not uh, mostly focused on the museum rather than as a practice as a sri lankan culture or sometime in other countries culture also because museum mostly focus the war or if not uh, the history of the kingdom or history of the regime like that most of the museum and also museum is protected and preserved and uh, promoted by the government rather than there is no any kind of a practice or culture among the community to protect their uh, history or uh, preserve their cultural heritage and that kind of uh, cultural thinkings very less among the uh, generally among the communities except apart from the academics or uh, intellectual fora so in this background only i have started this museum at that time the prime focus is to create a, a, a dialogue among the community about the particular communities exclusion and their contribution during the development of this country because the plantation uh, the currently they call themselves as a hill country tamil community those community when they brought by the british they are belonging to the one of the most underprivileged community in southern part of tamil nadu you all know that india is consist of a caste system Uh, these are the community which are consist of nearly 80% of depressed caste community so those people were brought down to sri lanka and uh, they were worked in the coffee and tea plantation but they contributed but they were contributed to the, uh, the current uh, infrastructure facilities which are enjoyed by it, it can be a um, road construction or it can be a rather railway harbor and everything was increased as a result of this coffee later tea and rubber plantation so these communities contribution not only for the production of the tea coffee and the rubber but rather than it they contributed for the infrastructure facilities of the community but fortunately these communities leaders or these communities um, leaders they are not in a person in the the colonial period to fight for their right and win their right but that is one aspect the second thing is soon after the independence this community is totally deprived the citizenship right by the the new regime the independent regime they deprived the citizenship right soon after the independence within 6 months as a result of that the continuation of uh, uh, the statelessness led to Uh, far behind compared to the other community and not allowed to enjoy any kind of a development rights which offered by the government so the exclusion continues as a result of that this community the exclusion how it um, lead to the their social background which they are culturally they are not in a position to develop their cultural things and they became a cultural assimilation because of the Uh, surrounding areas and also they lose their heritage and all that so taking into consideration all those things back like socio economic and cultural factors only we can create this uh, museum but after 10 years collecting all artifacts and uh, with the support of the peradeni university archaeology department i hired a um, line room which was a 10 by 12 rooms is a uh, sort of a 5 or 3 line rooms which are erected by the british during the colonial period even now most of the community um, plantation workers are living in those line rooms and we identify a line room and store all these artifacts and all that with the support of the um, 
uh, the University of Viradhaniya, Professor Sudarshan Chanivar is a friend of mine. With the support only, we opened this uh, museum for the public. So with the intention to create ethnic harmony and create because uh, when we initiated, when we opened the uh, museum at that time, because the ethnic was prevail in this country, and when we collected the artifact also ethnic of prevail. So we thought it's a good opportunity once we educate the community about their contribution, about their exclusion, then it will need to build ethnic harmony uh, and obtain solidarity from other uh, communities and, and uh, other <clears throat> societies, as well as it will lead to convince the policymakers of this country to look at their fundamental right violation and to bring some kind of a, uh, affirmative action for those. Things. So these, then when we initiate this uh, museum, uh, you know, uh, after opening publicly opening this museum, we were publicized in the media and all those digital and um, print media and also we send um, letters to the, all the schools and everywhere. But the visitors is very less, except because, the, because in Sri Lanka, there is a culture where while you are studying in the schools only, the schools there is in the month of February, they will take uh, for the outdoor uh, exposure. Uh, the, that time only, they used to take the children to the especially the museum, which the National Museum based in Colombo. Other than that, uh, we don't have a culture in Sri Lanka to um, uh, go and see the museum and visit the museum. The, the adult mostly in Sri Lanka, we don't have that culture. So that is also one of the setbacks in this country because uh, uh, the community is not willing to um, visit uh, the past, uh, visiting the, uh, uh, the museum. And also in Sri Lanka, there's another thing is because the museums are not uh, mostly uh, the people's focus museum. Like in other countries, there are community museums. I think this is the only community museum in Sri Lanka, according to my reading, my understood, because truth, uh, 1997, we the, this is the only community museum which focus one indentured labor community. Now, now they um, become a citizens of a fully citizen of this country, but this is the only museum. And there are in communities, several other communities, they have oppressed um, class, caste, and there are so many sectors in the communities, but there is no uh, culture or there is no intention to create a particular community's community museum. So that is the one of the thing where as a result of that, the visitors to this museum is very less. And also uh, we are using this museum to educate the community and all that. But that type of thing is not used by, but Soon after this war ended, there are some attempts were made in Sri Lanka uh, for a digital museum and also religious museum and all that. But beyond that, there is no any kind of a, uh, ideologically or any kind of a, uh, activism created uh, in Sri Lanka. So uh, therefore, there's a need in Sri Lanka to create, a, a, a promote a culture, museum culture. Why museum is needed? how museum can contribute for the ethnic harmony, contribute for the democracy, contribute for the uh, <coughs> human rights uh, protection and all that. So that culture should be, we have to build in Sri Lanka. And also uh, this museum, we didn't, uh, I didn't get any fund from anywhere. Oh, this is collection of the people's collection, we get it. And when we promoted this even, uh, there is no any kind of a, um, external support for this because uh, um, 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 uh, the, the thinkers or the donors, they are not thinking that the museum or a museum, museum is most important to promote, uh, 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 pr promote and, uh, uh, ethnic harmony as well as democracy and also to preserve the cultural heritage of the particular community and promote the cultural and also tolerance and, and um, accommodate. So that culture should be 
I think should be promoted. I don't know other countries and all that, but here we have to promote that because otherwise it is difficult to move. Because when I try to reach outreach, because we are not in a position to outreach, we initiate a kind of a attempt <coughs> with the artifact. We have a six uh, compartment in the museum. We consist of artifacts and photographs and uh, historical documents and folklore and um, uh, musical instrument. So we thought uh, to take this instead of uh, bring um, because to break the uh, uh, the bottleneck where the people are not visiting the uh, uh, museum. But we thought to uh, take um, outreach by organizing a mobile uh, museum. That through that we can promote the culture, mobile museum culture, but we couldn't afford uh, due to some various reasons. But I think uh, uh, in the current situation, not only here, in even any other uh, countries which are uh, totally uh, facing this uh, exclusion, whether it can be a class or a caste or a ethnicity or a, a gender group or a um, minor. Um, 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 uh, minority groups. So uh, we should use this. So um, um, if, uh, otherwise, we are not in a position to promote a, a general thing because museum is a very good uh, uh, thing. We are we can have a, a dialogue, citing because we are uh, how the people fought for their right. Because in, if you take the plantation community, even though they are totally ignorant, they are totally. Um, uh, ignored by others, but they attempted from their capacity to resist from the because for you and in the museum you can come and see that in 19 that it's a consist of artifacts and other things from 1824 onwards where there are so many resistance initiated by the 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 poor the indentured labor working class. So that also because they fought for their rights and also their memory, how um, we have collected, because this community was the only community in Sri Lanka after brought by the indenture as indenture labor. They were uprooted uh, from Sri Lanka again and part of the people were sent back to India from after 1971 uh, onwards as a result of the two countries agreement, Siri Master's effect. The second thing is as some ethnic riots, these people were the most uh, uh, vulnerable, and as a result of that, they were migrated to the northeast. And even in the northeast, also they are um, um, uh, um, living as a subservient because they are the agriculture labor. So we collected the memo um, uh, oral history. The people who are migrated to India uh, after 1970s, the people who are migrated to the northeast, and also the people who are. Uh, living in the same um, uh, plantation and their forefathers. So there are so much of uh, enriched um, uh, uh, cultural um, heritage and also the memorialization, the history, their sufferings and their struggle. So it's all consists in uh, one place. So I think it's a good, this type of um, community museum can be used for the uh, broader perspective, broader and light. So that is why I'm thinking that uh, we have to encourage and promote uh, museums wherever possible to cite the, the past and the present and the and for the future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mutu, for uh, for this uh, presentation. We're gonna open uh, the the discussion to the questions from the audience. I don't know if the audience has any questions right now. Um, one of the first questions I wanted to ask is uh, that uh, most of you inside your museums touch on uh, questions of exclusion of communities, and it's on the portrayal of the, the history of this exclusion as well. And, and I was wondering, was it hard to, uh, to literally show it in the collections and in the way to frame it um, without being too uh, even exclusive in the way that you that you show it. I don't know if it's very clear as a question, but in a way that um, you have to explain the history of the exclusion, but without excluding the other ones that are not part of that of that of that uh, community. So how how do you do this? Uh, how do you portray this? 
I don't know if uh, Papen Gay maybe on the history of immigration. Yeah, I think, you know, uh, to take the example of the uh, permanent exhibit on which we're working now, we've um, uh, dramatically expanded the uh, previous permanent exhibit that mostly focused on the uh, European uh, migrants coming to uh, metropolitan France from the late 19th uh, century all the way to nowadays. Uh, so we've completely expanded uh, this uh, exhibit uh, by the inclusion of uh, the French Empire and earlier period, so that we start with the uh, year uh, 1685, which was uh, the year of the uh, publication of the uh, Black Code, this uh, um, uh, this legal uh, um, book that uh, provided a legal basis to uh, slavery. So it is a way for us to speak of the transatlantic slave trade, which is a form of migration. So you see how far we are from the classic uh, history of uh, a migrant coming to metropolitan France. We also deal, for example, with uh, the uh, Indian um, migrants that were sent to uh, the French Caribbean uh, in the late 19th century following the abolition of slavery, uh, the Chinese and South Asian migrants that uh, settled in uh, the French Caribbean, as well as the Réunion Island in the Indian Ocean. So. Uh, I'm mentioning that just to give you an idea of, of what we do, that is, we add things, we do not subtract, we do not remove, we just add stories. As Dominique was saying, it's about adding stories, it's about providing a, a larger, more integrated, more interesting, in many ways, uh, um, a framework of French history that includes the whole world, uh, the global France in many ways uh, that, uh, of course, um, uh, opens uh, a large, uh, a large uh, way to, to think about uh, the French empire and, and, and issues, of course, related to uh, colonization. And this is all the more important at the uh, Palais de la Porte de Ré as this building was built in 90 years ago as a, as a museum aiming at, at celebrating French colonization. So we are doing the other way around, which is a way to reinterpret also the, uh, uh, the museum itself. I mean, the construction, the monument, which is also important to us. So I, I think that including all this does not exclude anyone. It, it, it is important and interesting, even for the visitors who are not connected to the histories we are talking about. I think it's as important for someone a friend, uh, without any uh, uh, family connections to uh, recent immigration. It is as important for this person to uh, understand what uh, French history has been all about than for someone who has a direct connection to this history. Yeah, thank you very much, Papa. I'm, I'm, I'm completely agree with you. And I think that it's not, uh, but thank you very much also, Aurelia, for your question, which is a very important question because uh, some people, some not very good people are, are in fact trying to oppose. And I think it's very important to include. And uh, I think that what Pap said in the fact that it could expand our history is very important because it's not uh, this only one track minded history, French history which as we all know was designed by the Third Republic uh, in a, of course also in a colonialist in fact issue. So it's very important to expand it. And it's, uh, I think that for all of us and not only for, for, for the one of us that are concerned in terms of family, but for all of us, it's a new way of in fact having a, a new story for us. And I think also the other thing is about dialogue and something that we did, for instance, when I was at the Musée de la Croix, when we welcome, uh, the Fondation Turam, and also with uh, with Francoise, who was uh, uh, Francoise Vergès, who was uh, uh, there uh, with you yesterday, uh, is the fact that we 
had two, two types of labels. One label about history of art and telling you know uh, things about uh, history of art of the of the paintings, drawings, and so on. And another one, written by Françoise and also by other people from the Fondation Turam, and and uh, the Fondation Turam is a French foundation, in fact, uh, struggling against racisms and uh, trying to improve all any kind of education uh, against racisms and. Uh, and then to have two labels uh, was uh, the possibility of having a dialogue on works of art. And it's very interesting because then it opened up the subjectivity of the visitors themselves. As they are seeing two labels on the same work of art, then they feel allowed uh, to express their own opinions. And I think it's very important to, in fact, um, thinking uh, inclusive museums in terms of uh, expanding the museums, as Pap said, and also in terms of putting up and, and uh, reinforcing a dialogue, dialogue between people and the works of art, but also a dialogue between people visiting the museum. And I think that uh, museums are places where you can not only, uh, in fact, meet works of art, but also meet other people and in a way maybe meet yourself. It's something I mean too. I think that uh, the best way to meet oneself is certainly to go into a museum. Vindya and uh, Mutu, do you have uh, any comment on this question? Um, sure. I think uh, just to, um, Dominique, that was wonderfully articulated. Thank you. But I think museum going is sometimes seen as a solitary experience where you don't interact with other visitors. And I think that's something that we can all commit to remedying a little bit more to encourage interaction between museum goers to kind of forge conversations, um, especially when we're dealing with these sort of contested histories. And I think the other thing I'd want to add is that uh, we with the Museum of um, Religious Freedom, we've committed to thinking about this in terms of multiple forms and levels of engagement, rather than treating the sort of, you know, museum go or the museum audience as a kind of homogenous group of people. So I think we're using, instead of kind of, you know, choosing a language or other that might be a sort of, you know, lowest common denominator approach, what we've done is we've had multiple levels of presenting information, whether it's for scholars or whether it's for children or whether it's for young people or maybe those who might not be as technologically savvy. So it's about, I think, this kind of multi-layered approach where the museum doesn't also in how it presents information exclude anyone. Obviously for us, the bigger biggest intervention was in terms of language and trying to make everything that we put together available trilingually, which comes with its own set of, um, difficulties because of you know things like font instabilities which is something that we've been dealing with but um absolutely this idea of like you know forming communities around museums um and conversations i think is definitely an important intervention i think uh, uh, we used to uh, initially make uh, the visitors to make interact because when we uh, any visitors come to our museum we simply want to uh, uh, present uh, uh, the situation or the what the issues faced by them but uh, we have interact with them the current uh, the prevailing situation at that time not only focusing on the particular the community but rather than uh, we uh, explain them the prevailed situation at that time and not only the uh, particular community who are the other community who are became a victim or uh, became a victim of the exclusion and how it uh, lead to the uh, the victimization in the in in, uh, in in any section of the community so like that we just push the or the stimulate the community, so stimulate the spectators or visitors to visit to that uh, particular period and think about that. And that also created a kind of a dialogue. And for if you visit some of the, uh, the visitors, some of the notes, if you look at that in our museum, they put, they cried and they mentioned oh, this type of such a issues they face. We never thought about that. So like that, the interaction, through the interaction, we can make them as inclusive people and they, that will lead to a, a kind of a common understanding. 
so that's how we are plan and moving to accommodate other communities uh, when they visit the museum thank you we we have a question from the audience from uh, uma satkunam who's asking if you have faced opposition from the government or from a group of people and if so how did you deal with it uh, yeah because you know uh, you know as a minority community if you are going to initiate this type of uh, uh, museum which uh, side to show the uh, the um, semi slavery and also um uh, the how the colonial um suppress the community and those the post colonials or the independent government of they suppress that all uh, reflect in the museum so once anyone comes and see that it will create a kind of a thing that they try to uh, create a um insult to the country and all that but there are some opposition came that opposition also came from not from the politician not from the um uh, people but uh, initially uh, it came from the intelligence at that time initially why you are creating for this and there's one or two but once we explain it's gone but only thing is in our memorialization because memorialization is the biggest issue in current situation so we have uh, migrant workers who have migrated from 1977 and 81 83 and before that uh, 53 to the northeast and they also became part and parcel of the uh, the war and war victims and they face so we have collectors collection of uh, um, oral history but we are not in a position to um, uh, put it to the public uh in the museum but if we were to put that then it will create more because we thought we but we did one or two exhibition in colombo with that with that uh, how these migrant uh, these worker from uh, community migrated to north and how they suffered and also what is their suffering in the locally um but uh, during the last period we did one or two um but that all outreach exhibition but rather than we are not uh, publicly Uh, bring that but we we'll think if we make it public in the museum if anyone comes they can ask then we will give but if not if it is a public then it will create some kind of a problem dominique if you want to add yes we have been we have been we we, we have been faced to uh, in fact opposition not by not from the the, the french government of course uh, not at all but uh, from in fact some people who uh, have in mind or had in mind the fact that museums should be for only a type of people. And who, who, so we think, because I think they are still thinking it, but we, we think that uh, uh, it's, um, it's a privilege to, to come to museums. In fact, they, certainly these people haven't understood what museums are about, because something I always say is the fact that museums, modern museums, are in fact a revolutionary and modern creations. Museums are recent creations. They were invented at the end of the 18th century, so a little bit more than two centuries ago, which is in fact not very, uh, not, not, uh, is not, uh, it's uh, very close to us. And the other thing also, they are revolutionary. They want to open up to anybody, remember what they are in fact, and uh, to present the royal collection, especially in France, to everybody. And I think that people who want to clothe the museum for themselves and thinking of something like a club, in fact, of course they are wrong, but they are very much against any opening up of the museum. So it's, uh, it's very interesting because it, uh, we, we need uh, maybe not to convince them because it's, maybe it's quite difficult to convince them, but certainly to tell, as we said before, that uh, you know, it's uh, within including everybody, within sharing with everybody, that we will uh, go, uh, in fact, against this opposition. But it's an opposition in France, and Pap, in fact, know that very well. Even uh, within our intellectual world, there are people against that. There are people who want to close, in fact, and uh, the, the culture and intelligence within walls, and that's very important to... Uh, Breaking the walls, if I miss it. So, of course, it's coming back. Oh, a very famous pop song, but still, 
we need to. Um, Vindya and uh, yeah, I, I I am I completely agree. I would also add uh, that we currently live uh, through uh, a, a time when uh, there are um, in France as well as uh, abroad uh, um, powerful uh, waves of uh, xenophobia, uh, and uh, this uh, translates also in uh, the way uh, the uh, efforts by museums uh, such as mine. Um, are met with uh, some uh, resistance, some opposition, as we are sometimes accused of, uh, you know, of being too, uh, uh, I don't know, uh, too woke. Uh, that's the word, you know, these days in France, uh, as, peop as, as we were supposed to be at the, uh, you know, too, too pro-migrant, uh, to uh, not to promote enough uh, French culture as uh, it is understood uh, falsely, clearly, uh, and so on and so forth. So, um, especially on issues such as immigration and colonization, of course, these are uh, sensible issues from a political standpoint. Uh, so it, it is not easy to, uh, to deal with this uh, issues uh, these days in France, as they are uh, quite uh, hot, uh, politically speaking, a few months before the um, presidential election. This is not a reason to not to move forward, uh, to do things uh, in a way that is as uh, 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 scientifically based, I would say, uh, with uh, uh, works, with uh, uh, articles, books by uh, historians on which we base our uh, exhibitions, but uh, we, we, we feel there's, there's winds uh, of um, xenophobia, sometimes racism, uh, anti-immigrant uh, uh, discourses uh, floating around, uh, and, this, uh, and this is also something we, we pay attention to, obviously. Um, just to add to that, um, our museum is very much in its nascent stages. We appreciate and have thought a lot about um, how some of the material might be received precisely because of the nature of what we're addressing, which remains um, perhaps disagreed upon um, status quo uh, within the current kind of social and political moment. We're lucky to have a museum team that is wholly ethnically, linguistically, religiously diverse that has allowed us to have a lot of enriching con conversations and we are very confident about what we put together. Um, so it remains to be seen how it will be received. Um, but I hope even maybe in starting a conversation, even in disagreement, it might be generative towards um, addressing some of the conflicts and tensions that we um, include in this museum or try to grapple with through the work of this museum. Thank you. Um, we have a question from the audience from uh, Sujata Mikama, who's uh, mentioning the exhibition from the Asian Civilization, uh, Asian Civilizations Museum of um, Singapore, if I'm not mistaken, called uh, Faith, Beauty, Love and Hope. There was a collaboration between the curators and those all those who worked at the museum, including security, where one label was by the curator and the other one was by the non-experts and the labels of the ordinary people were the most interesting, according uh, to her. So um, she's curious to know from the panelists about uh, community curated exhibitions and uh, if you've ever experienced it or what your thoughts are on it. Uh, for the time being, we haven't got so far, not community based co exhibitions, labels, yes, because uh, it's something we Especially, especially I, I did when I, when I was directing the managing the, the La Croix Museum, but not the overall exhibition. Only some labels uh, written written by some part of the visitors who, who have been asked uh, what was their, their, their most preferred 
works of art within the, the museum. So, and then afterwards, they, 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 some of them wrote the labels. Um, so it's not something we have been into yet, but something that we, we did some years ago at the Musée de la Croix and that will take place next year, if I'm army right, at the Museum of Fine Arts in Chartres uh, in France, uh, is the fact that we have um, invited uh, some uh, students of Ecole du Louvre, uh, which is a school uh, of history of art in, uh, in France. And um, 10 students of the Ecole du Louvre uh, completely created an exhibition, of course, with our support, of course. Uh, but they, they themselves created the exhibition. They, they chose the subject, uh, they organized the overall exhibition, they chose the works of art, of course, and they, were, they have been into all the process of the exhibitions up to the survey to visitors, to ask visitors if they were pleased or not with the exhibition. And it, had been, it has been a tremendous success, I must say. Uh, of course, among the students, the students who created the exhibition, the 10 students who created the exhibitions, but also students who did not create the exhibitions who were very much interested in too, the process. And very interestingly, interesting also for people coming for, to the museums, you know, common visitors come in, coming to the museums, who are very much interested that the fact that we open up to uh, different people, in fact, and that other people uh, were able to, um, to think about, um, about the museum to design an exhibition. So it's very interesting because it's the first, it, it was the first experience, and of course it should be, in fact, uh, in fact in, developed and in other way. But um, something interesting is the fact that um, when we design exhibitions, people currently think that we, we do so not only because we have the knowledge, but also because we, in a way, we are owning museum. And the fact that giving uh, the creations of exhibitions to other people is in fact uh, opening up uh, the museums and recalling that museums, museums are belonging to any of us. And not at all to curators. I'm not the owner of museums, of course. I'm, you know, I'm serving the museum. I'm not the one who owns of course. Does anyone else have any thoughts on this? Um, yeah, I can go. Uh, one of the th ways in which, I mean, again, we're very much in the early stages of developing this museum into something and we're all in kind of uncharted terrain because it's not like we've previously developed a virtual museum. Um, so we've been experimenting and I think one of the ways in which we've been um, trying to include elements of community collaboration, participation uh, is one through um, engagement with artists and encouraging artists to reflect on some of the themes of the museum, to travel and kind of create um, audiovisual material um, that sort of um, offers commentary on some of the themes that we delve into. The other side of it is that one of our clusters, which we're going to be kind of launching with, we're initially starting with three clusters in the museum, which look at, religion and the colonial state, um, religious harm and conflict, and then um, the legislative um, aspects of freedom of religion and belief. And for the conflict cluster, which is needless to say, one, probably one of the most difficult things that we've collectively worked on because of the nature of the material, um, we tried to minimize our presence as curators, as museum researchers, workers in it, and to incorporate actively um, audiovisual testimony from the communities to explain the events that we cover instead of offering our own explanations. We've offered very brief um, uh, texts kind of giving the basic facts of, you know, um, some of the events that we cover, but we've, uh, with the um, participation of field researchers who belong to the communities themselves, we've we'll included a lot of um, audio and visual testimony in order to give, it, give these events um, slightly more multifaceted um, uh, 
conveying um, to an audience who may or may not be familiar with some of what um, we're addressing. So uh, we will see how that uh, develops further. We're hoping to include it into as many spaces of the museum as possible so that there's also a sense of community ownership in some of what we're doing. So um, that's what we're doing with the Museum of Religious Freedom. Yeah, we are okay. at the uh, yeah. Museum in History of Immigration. We are preparing an exhibit that opens in uh, two years, more, more than two years, on um, East Asian migrants to France, uh, mostly focusing on the Chinese and uh, um, Southeast uh, Asian uh, migrants uh, to, to France, France understood in a global sense, as I said uh, earlier. And what, I, what I've set up is, uh, you know, instead of just preparing the exhibit uh, with the, uh, the historians, the uh, curators, uh, and then opening the exhibit and hope that people will come, uh, we are in touch and we've signed a, a an agreement with a series of uh, associations of, of migrants, uh, East Asian migrants uh, currently living in France, as uh, I, I think that it is uh, of high interest to uh, interact with local communities, especially those which are directly connected to uh, a project such as the one I'm talking about, which is of course, a way for us to learn, to have uh, all kind of new ideas. Uh, there's the people who are talking to are also very excited because they are giving us uh, a number of documents of items that we would include in the uh, exhibit. All this makes for a more interesting, more inclusive uh, exhibit. So I think it is uh, highly interesting to include uh, the communities way before the opening uh, of the exhibit, but in the, the preparation of the exhibit uh, and to make the exhibit theirs in, in, in many ways, uh, so that they feel that this exhibit talks to them in ways that would be impossible if, we're, if uh, they were just considered as a potential public. I think uh, uh, I can answer the question raised by Sakunanathan and also, uh, uh, you know, uh, we initiated uh, uh, the community level uh, mobile uh, exhibition uh, several years ago, but it was uh, uh, one in, in metropolitan city in Colombo, another one in University of Peradeniya, another one is uh, among the community. But only thing is because of the the lack of fund, we were not in a position to continue. But uh, through that, uh, we experience when you have this uh, uh, the outreach, uh, the community, then there are so many dialogues and so many questions raised by the community, and also some of the community members contributed their artifacts. So that also taken place, but unfortunately, we are not uh, funded by any organization. But in the meantime, that uh, uh, she had raised the question that uh, uh, the plantation workers, when they are working in the field, they will sing songs. And also, uh, apart from singing songs while working in the uh, 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 field, and also they also have that uh, history there how they migrated, how they get, uh, walk towards uh, the, uh, the virgin forest of Sri Lanka, moving more than 200 miles, but all those are in the folklore. So we collected all those folklore and we have recorded something. But only thing is, um, we, the recordings are not in a time to time, we won't reverse because we don't have any uh, kind of uh, uh, permanent uh, digital uh, equipment to keep all those, but we have that uh, folklore and also the folklore with resistance because most of the folklore, when the women or even the men, they used to sing again the uh, the white uh, planters and also the 
oppressing uh, uh, the Khanganis. So we collected all those things. So that uh, purpose also we have in the museum, but it's not in a uh, not in a person when the visitors come, not like in a, because this, this museum is actually, it's not fully uh, digitally or fully equipped one because all, all, everything is in manuals. Therefore, whenever the people comes, we will uh, put the cassettes and we will show the listen to this folklore. So that is the um, prevailing situation in the museum. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, before moving to the other question that uh, we've received, I wanted to go a step further on this question of having community based uh, exhibition is on the question of the museum staff itself. Um, because of course, it's also a question that it's seen as a very elitist institution to even work for. And that also have has a strong link with the, um, the narrative that is portrayed in it. And was this a question that you've uh, that you've had to to go through internally in, uh, in your respective museums or that you're currently addressing? It's a very good question, Aurelia. It's um, it depends if I miss it, so I will say yes and no uh, uh, answer. Um, uh, no, because many people involved, especially in all interpretation, uh, in fact, issues within the museums are very open, so they are very pleased to open to to other people, and it's exactly what they are into. And yes, because once again, as we said before. Um, some, in fact, want to keep the museum for themselves. And, uh, um, and as Pap said at the very beginning of the panel, I think that certainly it's an issue of education and an issue of education that going far, in fact, uh, uh, above and beneath and from the museum, it's not in that the museum duties education, of course, on the museum duties, uh, uh, only. And uh, it's certainly another way of, uh, speaking of uh, uh, education and also educational achievement, what is uh, today uh, being uh, a good student? Uh, and certainly being a good student today is not what it used to be. And that uh, we have to think of that. I think that uh, uh, achievement in terms of education is, is, is a key issue if we want to go further. Does anyone have uh, any comment on the, this? Um, I think this is more about my own uh, positionality in relation to what I do. I mean, I'm a Sri Lankan scholar and I've been educated in and I work in within the kind of constraints, but also privileges of the Western Academy where as of late um, has been compelled to confront its own complicity, uh, you know, with the imperialist project, echoing a lot of what, you know, Pap said at the beginning, those conversations hold true in the UK, where there's a lot of conversations around decolonizing museums and decoloniality in general. And I think having that sort of conversation constantly in the back of my mind, as I also engage with, uh, within something in this sort of post post-colonial post-war space where we're confronted by you know a whole other set of dynamics I've been actively thinking about how to not perpetuate some of the um some of what we discuss in the abstract here vis-a-vis -vis what the kinds of actual challenges that confront museums as um Mr. Mutulingam very rightly pointed to about you know lack of resources lack of you know particular skill sets to do the kind of preservation archiving record keeping work that museums you know are also doing um and how to bridge some of that um through you know greater engagement with communities and you know um again, not replicating some of the violences of the museum itself, um, when you think of it as this kind of colonial, you know, invention that comes with its own baggage, as it were. Or we, we can uh, move forward to the, to the other question that we've uh, 
received from Shash Travet, which is a very specific question uh, on the for Mutu, um, because uh, he's interested in poetry from the plantation Tamils, as well as the song they sang um, while picking tea. And um, the person is wondering whether the museum preserved these oral sources and how do they represent the history of these people in Sri Lanka? Can you repeat it again? Sorry. <laughs> uh, it's, it's regarding the poetry that uh, comes from the, the plantation Tamils and uh, whether you preserve these oral sources and are you displaying them or representing them in the museum? I think the microphone is, uh, is cut. Yeah, uh, we are recording and also we are preserving that and also in uh, written form also we collect it and keep it that. And um, uh, there are some uh, old uh, ladies and uh, we recorded that also because some old ladies they still they used to sing that old folk song which are sang by their forefathers. Uh, and also because the young girls also because they, uh, it is a... Um, uh, it comes, comes from mouth to mouth, uh, not as a wording, but uh, their grandma saw, uh, sang that song, it will come down, and the granny now singing. Like that, we recording. Used to, time to time, we used to record and keep it. But the only thing, as I mentioned, that the preservation is the biggest issue we are facing. Thank you. <laughs> um, I also had another question regarding the role of NGOs within the, the museum field and whether you work directly with, uh, with I don't know, for some, some form of partnerships with NGOs and uh, how can they complement each other in, uh, in the, the, the written history that, um, that you have of your collections and the activism also around it. Yeah, because we are working with the one of the uh, uh, NGO called that International Coalition of Sites of Concern. We are a member of that uh, organization, but they uh, also supporting us uh, to collect the, uh, the oral history uh, of uh, the, the war victims and also in other uh, communities also. That, but uh, uh, most of the NGOs are not... Uh, uh, they are, there is no mandate for them to institutionally support for the museums in Sri Lanka. So that is the, one of the issues we are facing, even though uh, the NGOs are supporting for collecting oral history. Other than that, uh, they are not uh, in a position to support, uh, to institutionalize the existing museums. And, and Vindia, coming from the, the NGO also, or from the Minor Matters, which is an NGO, if I'm not mistaken, uh, do you think this positions you differently compared to, uh, to being a state museum, for instance? Does it change kind of the voice that you're going to have uh, as a museum? Uh, I think it absolutely does. I think because the infrastructure and museum practices in Sri Lanka remain completely mired within how they were set up by the British colonial administrators. Museums haven't evolved, particularly the state museums haven't. And um, there's been, there have been some interventions regarding archeological museums around the country, for example, to kind of, you know, improve practices, but I think there's a long way to go. And I think one of the things that makes this museum project very different, as I pointed to earlier, is that, you know, we, aren't necessarily working with material objects or a collection in the same way that a traditional museum would. So in many ways we've had to quote unquote invent our artifacts um, to think about what can become an artifact and how you know there might be different ways to define that. So I hope it's different um, to some of what exists in terms of state museum practice. Also in, I think, a more diverse narrative um, around Sri Lanka's ethno-religious communities that is um, 
doesn't really exist within the existing um, museum space. And, uh, and Papendier from the Museum of National Immigration, uh, the National Museum of Immigration, uh, do you see also partnerships that are opening up with the civil society and, uh, and NGOs or not necessarily? Uh, civil society, for sure, as I mentioned, uh, when talking about uh, uh, people of uh, East Asian and South Asian and Southeast Asian uh, descent for uh, the opening of an exhibit in two years from now. Uh, NGOs, uh, not for now, although I do not exclude it. I think the more uh, we open the doors and windows, the more we connect to society, to civil society as well, the more we connect to, um, uh, to uh, international uh, uh, partners, uh, the better it is in, in, uh, in many ways. And, and, uh, and the more we are able to uh, serve the, the public, um, provide them with uh, interesting exhibits, of course, plus of many, uh, many uh, cultural activities, uh, uh, concerts, uh, performing arts, uh, which we also um, have. So this is something uh, also which obviously museums are more and more engaged into, that is uh, the uh, possibility to have all sorts of cultural activities ranging from uh, classic, I would say, academic uh, roundtables uh, tied to whatever exhibit is uh, uh, is organized, plus um, the performing arts, uh, concerts, dance. Uh, all this makes museums uh, vibrant places, places where you can say, oh, there is such a great concert at the Louvre, for example, or well, there is such a great uh, uh, performer, whoever sh she may be, at the Louvre or at uh, whatever museum you can think of. So this is also, I think, uh, crucial when uh, uh, figuring out what uh, uh, a 21st century museum can be. Uh, and it's way, and it goes beyond the uh, classic uh, exhibition. It 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 just has. A, a more a global uh, cultural offer uh, that uh, makes museums, I think, uh, attractive, vibrant, and also that can attract um, young people. You know, not the not the the teenagers and the children uh, who often come with their uh, school. Uh, not the uh, senior people. That is the the core of the classic. Uh, museum audience, but people in between uh, the, uh, the, the 20s, the 30s, um, students, also young parents uh, in, the uh, in their 30s and later, uh, who uh, are sometimes too busy or who, in, for many reasons, do not come so much to museums. So we had this uh, a uh, range of uh, visitors, which uh, we also want to attract uh, through a diversified uh, offer. Thank you for, for these answers. Um, one last question I, I had was uh, specifically on Sri Lankan museums and uh, how you were mentioning, Bindia, that you, you have a trilingual museum. And I was thinking of the language barrier and do you think it has been a challenge in your outreach strategy? And maybe, I don't know if um, even from Le Louvre, which has its uh, communication strategy in uh, so many different languages, how do you overcome also this um, this uh, this uh, aspect, and how do you manage to have a, a comprehensive uh, multilingual presentation and inclusive? <laughs> um, thank you. That's a great question, and I actually want to um, refer back to something about 
something Pap mentioned in his presentation about the lack of diversity within spaces. And I do think language barriers sometimes come with the lack of diversity at decision-making levels. And, you know, as I pointed to before, we're very lucky to be a wholly trilingual, multi-ethnic, multi-religious team of people where the language hasn't been an accommodation that we have to make, but something that is integral to how we work. Um, and I think that is perhaps unusual given some of the language politics in Sri Lanka, but we're very uh, committed to making sure that language doesn't preclude access to anything that we're making available. So, you know, it has from the get go, we've been working with translators, we've been working with um, researchers who operate in different languages in order to produce the best material and then make sure that we're also able to make that material available. So I'm actually quite proud of the intervention that we've made in this respect. And I think is something that across the board, you know, uh, not just within museums, people should be committing to because it is possible. It's um, perhaps the only limitation has been in terms of navigating some of the technical difficulties of making uh, content available because of, you know, fonts and things like that, which don't always work in the way that you think they will work because of, you know, various instabilities, but we're getting there. So, um, we're also learning. I imagine that, you know, sometimes things like translations can be contested, et cetera, but, you know, we're willing to work on it because it's a priority for us. I think uh, since the inception, <clears throat> you know, that uh, uh, there's a need for a trilingual and also uh, since the inception we uh, started, uh, we try to focus uh, 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 hiring uh, translators and also uh, some voluntary uh, voluntary person to do the language translation to every artifacts and also even for the collective materials and all that that uh, we practice but although it is a very little bit of difficult task but uh, we are compelled to continue that trilingual because our motivation at that time is to educate the major community who are lives in the country to in order to understand the plight of the the indentured labor community were brought by the uh, British. So with that intention from the beginning, we more focus uh, the trilingual with the challenges. Great, interesting. <laughs> I think we're gonna go towards uh, our conclusion in case uh, uh, part of uh, one of the panelists has an additional comment to add on on these or the previous questions. Um, so thank you all for uh, for being here despite the adverse conditions <laughs> and uh, and for a very interesting conversation. I I know that I. I learned a lot um, as uh, I've been learning for all these sessions. And, uh, and thank you to the panelists for their time and for sharing, having shared so many insights on inclusivity and coming from very different perspectives, but uh, you all managed to have a, to, to have a very comprehensive uh, outreach policy, which is very impressive. <laughs> so no, now we will have a weekend break from the, the sessions on museums and the next session will be on Tuesday at 2.30 uh, p.m. Colombo time, and we'll be considering museum sustainability, so a new topic. And uh, we'll be listening to uh, Kinga Gregg, who's the curator and project manager of the Museum National d'Histoire Naturelle, Anaïs Roesch, who's the project manager at the Shift Project, and uh, they've been presenting their, their, um, their new uh, study on uh, decarbonizing culture. Shayari De Silva, who's the curator of the Jaffer Bawa Trust, Sunela Jayavarden, who's an environmental architect, Chani Pereira, a st strategic advisor of the uh, Academy of Design, and the conversation will be moderated by Azara Jalil, the editor-in-chief of Artra Magazine, who's our media partner for this series of conversations. So. Thank you all for, uh, for being here with us. And uh, as mentioned, the recording will be on YouTube. So if uh, for the, the people that couldn't make it today, <laughs> thank you. Thank you to you, Aurelia, because you, yeah, you, you are you so much a wonderful moderator, I must say. Thank you. <laughs> Very well prepared. Yeah, thank I echo you. that. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, thank you to all. Bye-bye. Have a nice day. Bye-bye. Thank you.